Well, good morning. And thank you for that very, very nice introduction. From, in listening to that, I'm, I'm also reminded that I've been uh, in the insurance business now since uh, 1980, well before all of you were born, and primarily with two companies, one at the insurance company side and now on the insurance brokerage side. And I was counting them up as you were listing uh, the various jobs that I had. And I've actually had 17 different jobs in those 37 years. So some people would say that's been a meteoric rise. Some people would say you've had trouble holding a job. So I'm not sure which is which. But it's really nice to be here with you today. I have a connection with Elizabethtown College. I was telling Stephanie that my daughter Taylor actually just graduated from E-Town uh, last May. Uh, she was here and she was a, a graduate with a major in English professional writing with a minor in graphic designs and communications. Had a very good experience here as did I as a parent. So I feel somewhat of a connection with you already. Uh, I would also say that I really applaud the university and also m and Mars for sponsoring these kind of programs. I think this is a great way and I wish that when I was in school we would have had these kind of opportunities which I did not. Being able to marry all the things that you learn from your professors, that you learn from your theoretical, to also marrying that up with the reality of people who are actually in the business world and applying those things through the School of Hard Knocks. So uh, I, I really look forward to spending some time with you today. I have a presentation prepared, but I also hope that we have some time afterwards for you to ask some questions, either that you've already thought of or that, that are derived from what I talk about today. So again, thank you very much for having me here. In terms of some of the things that I'm going to talk about, my, my major talk is about leadership principles and things that I've learned over the years and things that I've gathered and put in my own language that I'm going to present to you that hopefully you can, you can gain some tips and tidbits to help you both in your life as you get out there looking for a job and also if you find yourself in a leadership position either by starting your own company as an entrepreneur or by working in another organization. I don't expect you to memorize all 25 leadership principles. My rule of thumb is the 10% rule. If you can pick up two or three good ideas from this that you can incorporate into your own language, into your own systems that could be helpful, I would consider that a win, all right? The agenda for today, uh, I'm gonna give you an overview of my company so you have a little bit of an understanding of what we do, what we're all about, and why we might be different and better than some, than some other people that we compete with. I'm going to talk about some career opportunities that are available in the insurance industry, probably not something that you've often thought of. Most people do not think about that. You might think about you know, the gecko or flow and progressive type of thing, but you might not be aware of the depth and the breadth and maybe some opportunities that are available in insurance that might stimulate some interest. I'm then going to get into the leadership principles. I'm going to talk about a personal story to help ram home one of the leadership principles I'm going to talk about. Most people probably talk about their personal story in the beginning. I'm going to purposely move that to the end. And then again, have some time for questions and answers. OK, so you with me so far? Yes. All right, good. All right, our company, I'll just give you a brief commercial. We were founded in 1896. That's a long time. We celebrated our 120th year in business last year as a private, independent company. I tried to do some research last year, trying to determine how many other companies were in that same uh, ballpark. And it's, it was very hard to find because most private companies by nature are relatively private with their information. But I can tell you this, that's a very small and exclusive club. It's less than 100 companies that I was able to find that were in continuous private ownership for over 100 years. So we're very, very proud of that. We currently have four offices throughout Pennsylvania, headquarters here in Lancaster where we were founded. We have an office in Exton, suburban Philadelphia. We have an office in Y Missing, suburban Reading, and our newest office out in Cranberry Township in Pittsburgh, if any of you are from western Pennsylvania, serving western Pennsylvania. We're one of the largest independent agencies in the country. A lot of people don't know that, even though we're headquartered here in Lancaster. Just to give you an idea, there are approximately 38,000 insurance agencies in the United States. You might not be aware of that. And right now, based on revenue size, we're about the 125th largest insurance firm in the country. So if you, if you do the math on that, for those of you who are math or actuarial bent, uh, bented, uh, that's about the top one half of 1% of all agencies in the country based on size. 
So we're, we're very, very proud of that. Our goal was never to be number one. It's to be the best in our particular region with who we compete with. But we're also very, very proud of that because we fit a nice space in the marketplace between a local agent that pretty much just works on Main Street business in their own community and the big brokers who primarily focus on the Fortune 1000 companies. Most of our, the businesses that we insure and handle primarily have about 50 to about 1,000 employees don't have their own risk management or claims departments, they just want to run their budget, run their businesses, make their widgets, provide their services, and rely on us to take care of their risk management needs. So that's what we're all about. We manage approximately $250 million in client premiums, so we have some scope there. Uh, we're a full service agency, which means we do employee benefits, which is health insurance, life, dental, disability. We do property and casualty, which is workers' compensation, property insurance, liability, automobile, cyber liability, which is an emer emerging threat for a lot of businesses in the country. We do risk management services, which include safety services and claims management services. That's one of the things that's very unique about our firm compared to a lot of other agencies. And we also do personal insurance as well. Now we're not like Progressive or we're not like State Auto, that sort of thing. Most of our uh, personal insurance accounts are about 10% of our business. And most of our personal clients are also executives of the companies that we insure that need some specialized services. All right? So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a background and a commercial on our company. Some of the things that I think are competitive distinctions and how we try to market ourselves is our expertise and our service resources. Every agency of those 38,000 are always going to tell everybody that we've got the best coverages, we've got the best services, and we're going to make sure that we take care of you. And everybody's going to say that, but it's in the execution that really, that really means something. And obviously, as a privately held firm, one of the other things that we try to focus on is making sure that our clients know that we're going to make sure we understand and discover what their needs are and then match up the coverages and the services in order to meet those needs. One of the things I'm most proud of is that our retention is nearly 100% every year. This year, it's going to finish at around 96.5% retention for clients. The average insurance agency in the country right now, from a benchmark standpoint, retains about 89% of their clients. So that's something that we're very, very proud of. In order to grow, you've got to retain your current clients and add new clients. It's one of the basic math lessons of business. Mm -hmm. Okay? And just a testimonial, I didn't give you our entire capabilities brochure because I would have put you to sleep and we'd be here for a while. But we're very, very proud, obviously, when we talk about things ourselves. We need to be able to convince clients that they should want to do business with us. But when we get testimonials from other from clients, that's something that we're also very proud of. So here's a, here's a nice quote from one of our clients. And all the decisions I've had to make in my position, choosing EHD has been one of the best. Their whole team provides exceptional service. I've reduced our overall costs, and I wouldn't have recommended EHD to anyone in need of an insurance broker. So as you can imagine, we use these kind of testimonials when we're trying to attract new businesses to come with us and say, don't just listen to what we're telling you, listen to what people who have experiences with us say. All right? This is just uh, our four locations. That's in your information that you have, in case you need to know that. But uh, it's, it's nice to be a regional broker. There are not a lot of regional brokers in Pennsylvania. Most insurance agencies in Pennsylvania really operate out of one location in one town. All right, let's switch to the next channel, next chapter, which is career opportunities and insurance. And, and I actually did a presentation here last year, I think it was, when we were starting our first internship program and brought a student in from Elizabethtown to actually work for us for the summer. I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, this was really the, the, uh, the title of my speech, Work in Insurance, Seriously? Are you kidding me? Who would want to do that? And uh, there's, there's a really cool video where we're interviewing a lot of college students about their impressions of the insurance business. And it, it comes across like, are you kidding me? I'll be in a cubicle all day. It's a bunch of old people. You know, you're trying to scam people into buying stuff they don't need, blah, 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 blah. I never want to do that. Well, the reality is, is that there's a completely different uh, insurance industry out there beyond what you see in the TV commercials or what you might think of. It's not all about selling life insurance to a little old lady at night and joining the Rotary and having to schmooze people all the time. Uh, there are over 400 different careers in the insurance business. Whether you're on the insurance company side or on the insurance brokerage side where I am, and I happen to work on both sides of the business, 
There's, there are jobs in sales, obviously. There are jobs in underwriting, in marketing, in uh, human resources, in actuarial, in auditing, in social media, in data analytics, in uh, all those things. So I'm going to encourage you to keep your uh, eyes and ears open for those kind of opportunities. And uh, the working conditions are great. We hire a lot of kids that come out of business school. And there are even some people that actually major in insurance, if you can believe that. Penn State used to have a degree in insurance. They don't anymore, but we have one of our employees who graduated from Penn State with a degree in insurance. St. Joseph's University has the number one risk management program in the country. University of Georgia has a big program, and several schools do. But most of the people that come to us to work uh, do not have an insurance or risk management degree. They're in marketing. They're in business management. They're in math. They're in social studies, they're in history, they're in psychology. So um, uh, keep those things in mind. Uh, you're not working retail, you're not working weekends, you're not working at night. Uh, you're working primarily during the day, nice working conditions, good pay, good benefits. And the other thing I'll tell you, there are tremendous opportunities for advancement in the insurance industry. We have an older industry, although that's changing rapidly. A lot of people like to say about the business, it's male, pale, and stale. Do you get my drift? So there is room for diversity, and there's a tremendous opportunity because a lot of people over the next 10 years in the insurance business are going to be retiring. And that creates a lot of opportunities for somebody that comes in. Uh, we brought in a lot of young people over the last three years. Uh, you know, the word millennial is thrown around all the time, those people that are born after 1980. And the reality that I found out very quickly in the workforce, I was at an economic development conference last year, and they were talking about the workforce just in Lancaster County. It said that by the year 2025, 75% of the workforce in Lancaster County is going to be made up of millennials, those people born after 1980. And that was a real wake-up call, you know, for me. And I took a look at us, and we're actually at about 30%. Average workforce right now in Lancaster County is at 19%. And in only eight years, it's going to be, you know, 75%. So we're well on our way. But what that means for young people who are coming into the business world is that if you come in, and it's very much a meritocracy, it's not like working in government, there's no tenure there, you have to perform. But if you do a good job in 10 years, there's going to be tremendous opportunities, not just for whatever you want to do, but for leadership, for management, for ownership. And uh, I just wanted to throw that out to you as something for you to think about. The other thing is that I find these days there is so much cynicism about institutions, particularly by young people, about government, about businesses, about corporations, about CEOs, right? And um, one of the things I say to people when they're thinking about coming to, into our industry is that it's a noble profession. It's not just about making money. It's not just about our shareholders. We provide a service. We, prov we provide a service to businesses and individuals. If they lose their home, if there's a flood or a fire, all the things that you see going on, and they have insurance to get them back on their feet, we're providing them services. And we have a responsibility to make sure they have the right coverages to get back on their feet. We just had a client that had a $28 million fire. Tremendous amount of expense. And $7 million of that was business income and extra expense to help them while their business is out of business to keep their profits and their continuing expenses going. Cyber liability, I mentioned that. So we have a responsibility to be good with contracts like lawyers are, and great with service, and great with providing a great service to people. So I would challenge you with that. I like to say that we want to be a company that has a strong mind and strong muscles, that we can get things done for our customers. But we also want to be a company that has a heart and a soul. We're very involved in our community. And our employees really like that. Uh, we just raised $34,000 for the Boys and Girls Club just by having an afternoon cornhole tournament with sponsors. And we had a lot of fun. We drank some beer. And we raised money for a charity. What, so what's better than that? And I also think that a lot of people in the insurance business, and we pay particular attention to that, try to give back a lot to the communities in which we work, live, play, and pray. Okay. So again, for any of you who are business majors, management majors, uh, it's something I think you should maybe consider that maybe you haven't thought of previously. I mentioned before that we, we did bring a, a, an Elizabethtown intern on uh, this summer for the first time. And I just put this in here just to let you know that we did that to make a connection with you about Elizabethtown. Uh, it was Tara Young. She, she's currently a junior here. 
uh, in business administration with a minor in data analytics. And we had a project that we wanted her help on, and she came in and did that. So you might not think about, I'm going to work for an insurance agency and do data analytics. But we do a lot of benchmarking to provide that kind of information to our clients. So Tara came in. And this is a project that we have been wanting to do for the last couple of years, but we were too busy to be able to do that. So she did a lot of analysis on our current uh, book of business and the employee benefits area. And uh, in terms of the number of clients we had, how many were small clients versus large clients, how many were self-funded versus fully insured, uh, how many plans they had, etc. So you don't need to memorize the data or understand it. The point is I want to let you know that we were very proud of the work that Tara did. And Elizabethtown taught her well, as they're going to teach you well too. And she provided a great service for us. And this is the kind of information that we use now to take out to our clients and say, as you're making decisions about what you want to do for your employees this year, here's some information to get, let you know what other people are doing too. OK? All right, now let's start with leadership principles. And I've uh, grouped these into, into three areas. Uh, personal conduct, and we'll talk about that. Business acumen, things that you need to do when you're in the business world, particularly if you're in a leadership position in the business world, and some closing principles that, that I wanted to talk to you about before I left. Okay, Now, I don't profess to be perfect any more than anyone is in terms of living up to all these principles every day. You know, life is a constant struggle to try to be good, but I do find these helpful for me as a periodic reminder of things that I need to do or improve upon in order to be effective, not just in business, but also in life. I will also tell you that um, in terms of where these things come in, being smart and being able to apply your knowledge is really, really important. Okay. Everyone knows that. You've got to be smart and you've got to be able to apply what you learn in school and what you learn on your own. But I also think that there are more important factors and more complex questions about what really makes people successful. You know, how you play with others in the sandbox, how motivated you are, okay? how you learn from your mistakes and, and, and move on from them, uh, how kind you are, how loyal you are, how cheerful you are, how you get along with other people. Those are some of the things that I want to talk about here. So the first one and the one that's most important, that's, the, that's the really the foundation for everything that you do in business and in life is to be honest and display integrity. Seems like a no-brainer and those things may seem out of fashion right now, all right, either in the political world or the corporate world, but I'm going to tell you that over, the, over time, personal conduct, honesty, integrity, and these kind of principles are, are the moral GPS that will recenter everybody after a period of time. So don't become cynical. Don't become disillusioned. Realize that these things are extremely important. Always try to do the right thing, maybe especially when nobody is watching. I like to read a lot. Uh, I particularly like biographies. I like science fiction. I like mysteries. I like a lot of stuff, but I really like to read biographies. And George Washington is somebody that I really admire. I've read two of his uh, biographies. And Something I wanted to show you. This is actually a book that he put together called The Rules of Civility and Decent Behavior. A very quick read, but you might find this interesting. He was the father of our country. He was obviously well known throughout his life for being, you know, having a lot of good manners and conducting himself in, in, in a thoughtful way. At the age of 14, he wrote down 110 rules under the title of this book, Rules of Civility and Behavior. And these rules were drawn from an English translation of a French book that he found. And we're intended to remind him to keep his manners polished, uh, to, up, to keep his moral vir virtues upheld, and to especially inculcate the practice of perfect self-control. So I'm going to tell you that people in leadership positions really spend a lot of time on their personal conduct and what they say and that what they do and what they don't say and what they don't do and the impact it has on other people. I would encourage you to understand that that's a very important one. That's what I put at number one. Be positive, likable, and trustworthy. Sounds like something that you learn in, in kindergarten, correct? But I'm going to tell you how, how, how really, really important that is. Think about how you buy things when you go to the store or whatever. The business reality is this. People want to buy and want to do business with people that they like and they trust. Pretty simple. So what I'm going to challenge you to do is that 
everything, use everything that your parents taught you or your family has taught you, learned everything that you learn in school or on your own through the school of hard knocks, and do everything that you can with what God gave you to be likable and trustworthy because that's the one thing that's gonna make you successful, along with other things, but it's very, very important. Be the kind of person that people gravitate to rather than shy away from. Uh, don't be an Eeyore, oh, life sucks. You know, people don't wanna hang out with people like that, all right? Be positive, be helpful. Keep your promises, sounds like a no-brainer, but be reliable, be someone that people can trust, and always try to follow through and do what you say you're going to do. How many times have people told you to work hard, right? Work hard is extremely important. You can't just mail it in. You've got to give an honest day's work for your pay. You've also got to set high standards for yourself. Don't try to be perfect. Just If you try to be perfect, sometimes you have a chance to be excellent, but you've got to put in the effort. Display initiative. Initiative is extremely important. That's one of the most important characteristics that I look for when I'm thinking of hiring someone in our company. Is this someone that's going to make things happen or has to wait to be told all the time? So it's being proactive and driven to make things happen that are good or to stop things from happening that are maybe bad and that need to be corrected without necessarily waiting to be told. Remain humble and gracious. You have to have some confidence, particularly if you're in a leadership position. You have to believe in yourself, believe in your ability to get things done, but you can't get too big for your britches. You have to be always appreciative and humble and thankful for what you have. Don't get too high when things are good and don't, don't get too low when things aren't going well. As a leader, people look to you for some emotional stability. And if you are freaking out at work because of something that may have happened and they're looking at you, they're going to be saying, oh my gosh, we better get the parachutes out. There's something going on here. Be cool under fire. Don't let them see you sweat. Just analyze the situation, fix it, and then move on, okay? Be a good teammate. You know, uh, there are certain professions where a lot of the work that you do is on your own, that's fine, but God made us to be social animals. We need to interact, and there aren't many things that we can do in this lifetime without being involved with other people. So being able to enjoy working with other people, being able to get things done, being able to use other resources, being caring and unselfish and treating others the way you want to be treated, it all sounds like mom, apple pie, etc. but it's extremely important in order to be successful. Even as a leader, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about making decisions, I've gotta make a lot of decisions and, and Hopefully I'm right a lot of times, but there isn't anybody in this world that can hit that bullseye every single time. So you've got to rely on other people. Here's one that you might not have expected, but I'm really smart because I screw up a lot, all right? So screw up. In school, we don't really teach you to screw up, right? We, we try to teach you to do things the right way, do it right way the first time. Sometimes you learn a lot more from your screw ups than you do from the things that you do well. It's almost human nature when someone asks you, you know, tell me some things about your life. Most people remember the bad things that happen instead of the one good thing that's going on. But what I'm going to tell you is that don't be afraid to take risks. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. And uh, it, achievers develop a realistic tolerance to criticism, but as it says here, taking its lessons but not its burdens. Don't get bogged down by that. Do what you like and what you're good at and love what you do. You're going to have to find a job when you get out of school, obviously. Everybody does that, and that's a very stressful time. But what I'm also going to tell you is that you're going to have things that are valuable to a lot of employers, too. So you need to think about it in terms of, I don't want to just find a job. That's great. I want to do something that I like and what I'm passionate about. Because remember, the love of what you do combined with your belief in what you do will not determine your success. It'll determine how hard you will work at it. And once you do that, you'll find a way. I always like to say, if you want something bad enough, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. And I think that's very, very important. But it all starts with finding an industry, finding a job, finding a career, whether it's on your own, in your own business or working for another business. Find something that you really like, and you'll be a lot happier. Have a vision. Where there's no vision, the people perish. It's from the book of Proverbs. You know, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there, that kind of thing. So you have to have a vision, okay? 
Uh, you have to have a personal vision. My personal vision, uh, obviously, is most importantly to take care of my family, but when it comes to work, my personal vision is to protect, guide, and grow our company. And every decision that I make, everything that I do, is looked at through one of those three lenses, protect, guide, or grow. So when you're thinking about this, every company that you work for, and if you're a leader, it's your responsibility to describe for your organization, here's our vision, here's where we want to go, here's where we want to take the company. When you drive a car, you shouldn't just look right over the hood, you should look down the road, because then you can see what's coming around the bend as well as what's in front of the hood, right? Now let me give you an idea of how this really works in, in our company and in the real world so you can see taking it from theory to reality. This is something that I put together two years ago. You know, clever word, the year 2020 is coming up, so we call it our 2020 vision, you know, for clarity. And these are some of the things, I took excerpts from that just to give you an idea of how this vision statement is reality when you get into the working world. So here's some of our 2020 vision statements. Remain a privately held company. There's a lot of companies always trying to buy us and I'm determined to keep us private and independent. I think that's a competitive distinction. Fiercely protect, protect our reputation of integrity, professionalism, financial stability, and outstanding client service. You saw some of that. Invest in our resources to make sure we continue to grow the company. We're at 24 million now. We want to get to 30 million by 2020. Invest in new technologies. Technology in your life is changing so rapidly. It, it, it's amazing, and in our business, it's becoming unbelievable. People need 24-7 access to their claims information, to their policy information, to getting an ID card for their auto, and we have to be able to provide that for them. Our people need to be able to do things when they're on the road, not just when they're in the office. And that has, that's, that's a tremendous difference in what it used to be like. I'll give you a quick side story. When I started in the insurance business in 1980, in a little office in Erie, Pennsylvania, we didn't have one computer in our entire office. Can you imagine that? Not one computer. Didn't even know what they were. Everything was on, done by hand, notebooks, business cards. We would dictate letters, send them out three days later. They'd read it and send it back. That was kind of like the business world. Now, if you don't respond in about three minutes, they think you're, you're slacking and doing something wrong. Okay. More of our vision, uh, recruit the next generation of talented people into the company so that we can perpetuate. Create training and mentorship programs for leadership development, proficiency, and sales excellence. That goes hand in hand with, with what I said before about the need for us to continue bringing new people into the company. Strengthen our practice groups to give people the opportunity to manage so that we can be, have an incubator for future managers of the company. In about five or 10 years, we're gonna need a lot more people in management and we need to prepare them, give them some small tests of managing smaller groups so they get that experience. Continue diversifying our workforce. We've been intentional in trying to bring in people of color, a lot more women that we, we're 60% female, 40% male now in our company. A lot more women in management. We have women on our shareholder group now. And I'm determined personally, and that's one of our missions, to make sure that we continue to do that so that our workforce mirrors more of what our society is gonna look like by the year 2050, not what the insurance industry looked like in 1950, okay? And finally, something that's very important to me, clearly articulate and communicate our strategies for success regularly and work together to reach the highest possible levels. I happen to believe that most CEOs do a poor job of communicating to their employees what's going on, how we're doing, where we're at, where we need to go, what we need to focus on. I think they think they're doing a good job, and I'll put myself in that boat too. So I try to do that regularly. I do a series of things called fireside chats where three to four times a year I meet with every employee, every office in the company to tell them just those things. Hey, here were the plans that we set out to accomplish at the beginning of the year. Here's how we're doing so far this year. Here are some things that came in from left field that we now have to address and deal with. And here's what we need to focus on for the next quarter. And I found that people really appreciate that. It also gives them a chance to just talk to me one-on-one -on -one and not have me in the ivory tower. I get to listen and understand the issues and concerns they might have. And we've had a lot of good ideas, a lot of new policies, a lot of personnel policies that have stemmed from feedback that they've given me at those meetings. So if you're in a leadership position, the, the opportunity and the requirement to communicate with your constituents regularly is extremely important. Because a lot of people think that being a CEO or being a leader is about telling people what to do all the time. And I'm gonna tell you it's about leading from the front and pulling people along, not standing behind them and whipping them to move. 
All right? And the communication and regular contact and caring for your people is extremely important. Number 11, I'm a Beatles fan. I'm fortunate that my youngest daughter is now also a Beatles fan, so we'll keep it going for the next generation. But I stole this from their song, Carry That Weight. Boy, you got to carry that weight. You have to accept responsibility and accountability. And it is lonely at the top. When you're in a leadership position, you're running a company, you're running your own business, you're accountable for everything. And one of the things that really struck me that I, I thought of intuitively, but it didn't really hit me until I became the CEO of the company, is the unbelievable responsibility you have for other people and their careers and their families and their lives. So when I talk about security, God, and grow, all those things are to preserve those things. You're gonna find that when you become a parent that all of a sudden, and when you become married, and then when you become a parent, it moves from me, 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 to we, 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 to us, us, us. And that's the same kind of transformation that happens when you become the leader of an organization, too. You suddenly realize it's not just about me. I'm responsible for all these people. And boy, you got to carry that weight. I'm wrestling with a number of decisions right now relating to personnel, relating to finance, relating to what's happening with our health insurance renewal, relating to what's going to happen in Washington with tax policy. All those things and people are looking to me to help guide those decisions. And you've got to be able to handle that. And everyone, everyone's not cut out to be a number one person in their organization. And that doesn't mean there's something wrong with them. There's only one. There's a lot of people that could have very, very important jobs. But if you find yourself in that position, remember this. You got to carry that weight. Make good decisions seems to be a no-brainer. As I said before, you cannot always hit the bullseye yourself. You've got to rely on other people. You've got to gather as much information as you can based on the amount of time that you have. If you have an immediate emergency, you've got to make the call. All right? And I'm also going to tell you to focus on what's right for the company, not who's right. You know, you don't have to play favorites there. And don't be paralyzed by indecision. And I love this next quote. Think about this. Indecision is the reason why there are so many flat squirrels on the road, right? Think about that. It's true. I happened to hit one a couple weeks ago, and my poor wife, she was so upset. But he hesitated. I didn't mean to hit him, but that's what happens. Take care of customers. That seems to be a no-brainer if you're in business, but whether you're in the manufacturing side of the business or on the service side of the business, where most of our professions are now, you have to do what's in the customer's best interest. If you lose your customers, you don't have business anymore, people don't have jobs. So you have to respond quickly, follow through, and make sure you resolve their problems. The power of attention. Now we're going to talk about some business acumen things. The power of attention is extremely important. In fact, I think it's the single most important relationship skill we have, which is to be an important listener, not just a good talker. So here's some statistics. We think we listen, we really do, but we don't. On average, we are interrupted about every 18 seconds, and the only reason we listen at all is to give ourselves time to prepare for what we're going to say, right? You're smiling, you know what I mean. Given the opportunity encouragement, people will tell, everything, tell you everything, so become an encouraging and skillful listener. What do most people want to talk about? I know people that struggle with casual conversations. What do I talk about? I'm not that interesting. You don't have to be interesting. All you need to do is be interested in other people. Start asking them questions about their lives. You'll be amazed at how they open up. And I've heard people, I've watched people in a social setting. This person did all the talking. This person did all the listening. And the person who did all the talking said, my gosh, they are an awesome person to talk to. Why'd they say that? Because the other person listened to them, right? <laughs> Smile, keep good eye contact, but don't stare at them like you're going you're gonna to freak them out. Watch body language closely. Words are going to tell you what people say. Body language tells you what they feel. So if you're sitting across from somebody trying to be nice to them, and they're looking at you like this, chances are they're not really buying what you're telling them. So focus on that, and you might want to try something different if you see that happening. Ask a lot of questions about who, what, where, when, and why. Where are you from? You know, What's your major? What are your interests? What sports teams do you like? Tell me about your family. Tell me about your most recent vacation. Those are very innocuous things, but it gets people to open up. Next time, think of yourself as an interviewer. Try to listen twice as much as you talk. And this is my own. Adopt the physical cue. I talk a lot. I talk a lot with my hands. I'm half Italian, so a lot of people say if I broke my arm, I'd have a speech impediment, right? 
But I do like to talk a lot. When you're in a leadership position, people expect you to talk a lot. But I often learn a lot more from listening than talking. So I've actually adopted a physical cue. When I find myself wanting to take over a meeting or something, I'll actually, I, I, now, I now do this. And that's my own physical cue to remind me, shut your mouth, listen before you talk. And I'm going to give you that tip because I think it's something that's very, very important to you. A couple quotes to hammer at home. You can make more friends in two months by being interested in other people by trying to get in, than in two years by trying to get them interested in you. And this is one of mine. God gave us two ears and only one mouth for a reason. I think he was trying to tell us something, don't you think? All right. Power of attention, power of networking. You've probably, I don't know if you've had classes on networking or talked about networking. And networking sometimes gets a bad name. People think about it when you go in the business world. You've got to go to these mixers, these cocktail parties. You've got to hand out business cards. You've got to schmooze. You've got to do this. You've got to try to sell stuff. I think about networking in a completely different way. I think about networking in terms of what you give to other people to be a resource for them, giving them advice, helping them out. And in return, then, you develop trust. And they like you and trust you, like I said before. And then pretty soon, they're going to find that you're, they're going to be referring you to other people. And if you get a referral, it's like having a passport at the border. Let me give you a real life example. It just happened two weeks ago. I found out that there was an opportunity, a big opportunity for a new insurance co contract in town. Previous broker was screwing something up. A little birdie told me this. I called a banker friend of mine who I knew was investing in the project, and I called another friend of mine who I knew was working on the project as a construction manager and as the real estate investor in that project. I just said, hey, what do you know about this? What do you know about the buyer? What type of person is he? You know, what's his experience? What makes him tick? Do you have any leverage there? Can you put a good word in for us? And through that networking, the bottom line is we end up getting that deal. And that's a $50,000 revenue deal for our agency. And I wouldn't have got that deal without using the power of networking. Now, they're going to ask me for a favor in return, and that's the way it works. And it's not always about business. Sometimes it's, you know, I'm thinking about this, or I'm thinking about that, or I'm going to Italy. I heard you went there last year. What do we do? You know, where do we go? Develop your network. I, you all, you're all on Facebook. You're going to be on LinkedIn someday. Use that network. It can help you do a lot of different things. Power of persuasion, all right? At some point in time, you need to be able to persuade people. Everybody's selling something, and that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad connotation. But if you're in a leadership position, I'm selling visions. I'm selling strategies. I'm selling these are the behaviors that need to exhibit. If you're selling a product, obviously you need to sell a product. You're going to be selling yourselves when you try to find a job. So being able to present arguments, concepts, here's why you should hire me, and convince them to understand a group through point of view is a skill that you need to have and you need to develop and not be bashful about. Power of persistence. Persistence is very underappreciated and very undervalued. You might find this to be an interesting statistic that I tell our salespeople all the time. Statistics show that takes an average of 8.7 calls to get someone to agree to meet with you if they don't know you previously. Right? That's why that referral is so important at the top. That, that helps shorten that. But if you're just trying to get someone to meet with you or interview you or hire you or buy your product 8.7 times, so I always tell my salespeople, when do you quit? Three? Five? Eight? You got to keep at it. Because if you keep at it, eventually you're going to get in there. Stop the insanity. One of my favorite quotes is by Albert Einstein, who says, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. You'd be amazed at how many people in their own performance, in their own department, or in their own company. You have plans, you never reach your goals, but you keep the same plans again the next year. You don't change anything about your plans, your organizational structure, your leadership style, your people, or the control methods that you have in place. You change nothing, and you just hope that things are going to get better next year, or that we're going to get lucky, or the weather will be better. Well, I'm just telling you that that is insane. And as a leader, it's your responsibility to put a stop there and to change that and do something different. And that leads into the next principle, which is critique and correct. When things do go awry or your plans are not being achieved, you need to take a time out, not be cocky about it and say, what I said is great, you guys just aren't doing it right. 
take a time out, analyze the situation, choose a new path, and then move on. I use the word critique intentionally because it's different from the word criticize, is it not? The word criticize implies a judgment. I'm making a judgment. You're dumb. You're stupid. You're not doing it right. Right? Critique is more objective. I'm just going to analyze the root causes of what's going on. Things that we're doing well, let's keep doing them. Things that we're not doing too well, let's change those. I like the word critique a lot better than criticize. Balance high tech with high touch, particularly today. Again, when I started in the business, we, only, we didn't have any computers, then we had one computer. Then we actually had, get this, I worked in a cubicle, right? When I was a customer service rep, that was one of my first jobs. Somebody worked next to me in the same job. They cut a hole in the partition they put one PC on a lazy Susan so that we could both use the same computer. How crazy is that? All right, ancient history. Balance high tech with high touch. Technology is unbelievably powerful and I can't even imagine what it's gonna be like 10 years from now. It's very powerful in business by you're able to raise your own presence. You can contact anybody in the world at any time. Can you not? Do you not? You can find out a lot about other people's background and experiences and their businesses. One of the first questions we used to ask when we were starting out in sales was, tell me about your company. Tell me about yourself. What's the history of your company? Now you can find that out in five minutes in your car before you even go in there and you'd look like a fool if you asked those kind of questions. So that's important, as well as finding out about other people, who they know, what connections they might have, and, and where you can use your networking. But you also have to balance high tech with high touch. I never thought I would get to the point that I would say, particularly to some of our younger employees, there is actually a competitive distinction these days about having a business meeting with someone in person, looking at them in the eye, shaking their hand, looking at them face to face and having that kind of interaction. So I'm gonna tell you that both are important. So develop friendships personally, pick up the phone to talk to somebody sometime, don't just text or email them or Snapchat them, bump into people to chat in person, and sometimes just call somebody up to say, hey, just want to see how you're doing, I was thinking about you. Or something happened over the weekend that made me think about you. Or I knew your favorite team won, I just wanted to see what you thought of that. Okay? Uh, former CEO of Google, when he was addressing graduates of UPenn, he said it very well. Turn off your computer and your phone, discover all that is human around you. Be curious, enthusiastic, and passionate, and you'll find that they are contagious. So I'm not saying get rid of your technology. Technology is unbelievably powerful. I'm just saying balance high tech with high touch. Provide quality service. I want to tell you my $7 haircut story. How about those haircuts, huh? What do you think? Pretty bad? Well, my son was in between his freshman and sophomore year. He was the University of Pittsburgh chemistry, chemistry major. Uh, we were down at the Jersey Shore, we have a place down in Cape May, and he came down for the summer, spend the summer, and his hair was ridiculous, man, ridiculous. I mean, I grew up in the 70s, my hair was ridiculous too, but he needed a haircut. So we went to go get a haircut. So we pull into this strip mall, we see this hair place over here, and it says, haircut, $7. All right, looks pretty good. Right across the parking lot from that was a barber shop, and then the sign on the front window said, we fix $7 haircuts. <laughs> right? Think about that. I use that all the time in our business because a lot of the business that we get is because other competitors that we have are dropping the ball, aren't doing things right. And that's what I tell people. That's our, we fix $7 haircuts. All right? So good story. Think about that. Keep that in mind. Closing arguments, a couple of final principles I want to talk to you about. Never stop learning. I want you to just be curious, constantly read, explore, learn, experiment, polish, tinker, all right? Never think you've arrived. I happen to be a golfer. I love golf. I'm fairly good at it, but I've learned that golf is one of those sports that you never get it. Some days you think, wow, I got it. I found the magic formula. The next day, you don't, it's like you never played before. Same thing in business, same thing in life. I've been in the insurance business for 37 years. I know a heck of a lot, I really do, about coverages, about management, about leadership, I know a lot. But I will honestly tell you, the list of things that I don't know are still longer than the list of things I know. 
And I'm going to challenge you to always have that attitude because that keeps you humble, that keeps you gracious, gracious, and there's so many things in this world to learn. All right? And not just about your profession. You want to learn things about a lot of different things. And that's what leads into this. Leave a balanced life. Don't just be a one-trick pony. Faith, family, and friends are the most important thing in my life. And I also believe those are the proper order of things, followed by your job, your career, then maybe the Pittsburgh Steelers and golf and everything else, right? For those of you who are from Western Pennsylvania. But I'm telling you, live a balanced life. And selfishly, as a leader, I'm telling you that my employees, who aren't just you know, slaves to their desk every day and only worried about work, that have a strong family life, that take care of themselves physically, spiritually, and mentally, that have hobbies, and that read, and that garden, and that do this and that. They're also more productive at work. So that's the selfish part of it. But I'm telling you, you're going to be more successful in life if you try to live a balanced life. And, and maybe the most important lesson I can leave you with today before I open it up to questions is, can you take a punch? Can you take a punch? Everybody has a plan until you get punched, right? And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about my personal story and, and bring this home. So you heard my biography. I've had a very successful career in insurance. I've had 11 different jobs at my old company, six with my new company, right? I have a beautiful wife that I treasure and I cherish. I have uh, two beautiful daughters. You know, one who's 31 that blessed us with three grandchildren, which is unbelievable. Four and a half, two and a half, and now one, okay? I have uh, a nice job. I make good money. I have a nice car, nice home. I have a place in Cape May. I get to travel. We went to Italy this year. So there's a lot of people that would kill for my life, you know that, honestly. And I'm very blessed by that. I thank God every day for all the blessings in my life. But um, I can tell you this, that you know, life never goes like this, and life never goes like this. It's like this, right? Can't get too high, can't get too low, what I'm telling you. And I've been faced with some adversity. I'm going to tell you about that. Two important things in my adult life that I've had to deal with, that I'll tell you, that are always behind the scenes with people. Um, on October 29th of this year, just coming up in about nine days, uh, will be the sixth anniversary of when my son uh, died. My son, Tony, whom I mentioned, went to University of Pittsburgh, chemistry major, unbelievable kid. On August 2nd, he would have been 29 years old. Six years ago, almost, I got the phone call that no parent ever wants to get. Your son's gone. I screamed, I cried, my knees buckled. Cried out to my wife and my youngest daughter, Taylor, who graduated from here, 17 at the time. You know, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, it was, it was just unbelievable. The most unspeakable tragedy that you could imagine. He was a first year law student at uh, Duquesne University. He was working for my brother's law firm in Pittsburgh. Kid had an unbelievable future ahead of him. Would light up a room when he came in, was unbelievable. He was my $7 haircut story. Loved that kid to death, and he loved me too. But here's what happened, and, and here's a personal lesson here for you too. He was a chemistry major, should have known better. He wasn't a big partier, but he was a frat guy, liked to drink beer. He had a big uh, law exam that he had just finished. Him and his two roommates had an apartment in Carson Street in Pittsburgh. Went out to celebrate Halloween, went to a party, drank beer, did some coke, and I found out later, snorted some Vicodin, which I didn't even know people did. All right? Wasn't a big party, or guess what? His two other buddies did the exact same thing. They woke up, but he didn't. All right? So my personal lesson to all of you is when you're at your age, your late teens, early 20s, you kind of feel like you're Superman or Superwoman. You're invulnerable. Stuff isn't going to happen to me. And when I talk about making decisions and all those kinds of things, your life could change in an instant in the blink of an eye if you don't do the right thing. So that was an unspeakable tragedy, unspeakable tragedy. And I can tell you that that buckled me, that hurt me. And it was only my faith, family, and my friends that helped me and my wife and our family get through that. And my job helped me too, giving me something to go for. And I see people that go to a very dark place when that happens to them. And I don't judge them for that because I can see how easy it is to do that. But I'm also telling you that when you take that punch 
and you get back up and you fight through that adversity, that it's not only something that's powerful for you, it can inspire other people as well that see that. So I'm telling you that story not to feel sorry for me or to feel as though that we're some piece of fragile China that's going to break. I talk about my son, not all the time because it's a private thing, but I talk about him lovingly now because of my memories. And I can tell you that the waves of grief when something like that happens are so intense. The wave after wave hits you over time. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about him. Not a day, and there never will be. But the interval between the waves lengthens and you find other ways to be happy in your life. And I'm also reminded no one has a monopoly on tragedy. All of you in here have had people that have passed away in your families, I'm sure, okay? And it's very, very difficult. So no one has a monopoly on that. And I find now that it's helpful for me to talk to other people that have gone through that same thing because we help each other. Second piece of this adversity in my, in, my, in my adult life, two months after I was promoted to president and COO back in 2013, something wasn't feeling right, right? And uh, I found something on my body that just didn't feel right. I went to the doctor. And I heard those words that nobody ever wants to hear. You have cancer. This was two years after my son passed away. I was like, dude, what's going on, man? And I was very fortunate. It was testicular cancer, which is very rare for someone my age. But I found it early. I had a great doctor. Within a week after getting that diagnosis, I was in surgery, taking care of it. That particular cancer, I was very, very fortunate. I had a 96.6% success rate. I'm happy to report that I'm now four years cancer-free. Nobody at my company knew that except for my boss at the time. I didn't even tell my kids because I didn't want to scare them. And we were still getting through my son's death, so I didn't tell them that. And until I went in, until I was a year into it, my treatment was good and I knew I was clean. And then, then I told everybody. So when that happened, I was taken aback. I was still you know, reeling from my son's death. But I had to keep doing my job. So what I'm telling you is this, that you're going to get punched in the face. You're going to get punched in the gut. And hopefully you won't have those two things happen to you. But stuff's going to happen at work. Stuff's going to happen in your personal life. And you've got to balance all those things. And you've got to fight through it. Because you also got to take care of your career. You can't take care of your family if you're not taking care of your career, can you? So this story isn't intended to bring you down. It's intended to lift you up and let you know that I'm not the only person that lost a loved one and had to fight through that. I'm not the only person that had cancer, and some people don't survive that. I was very lucky that I was able to survive that. So I'm not telling you that to feel sorry for me. I'm telling you that I learned a very valuable life lesson by that. I have a lot of different empathy now for what it takes. There isn't anything at work that's going to bother me now because I face these two things. But by fighting through that and sticking to that, fighting through that, I think I've been able to help some other people too. And I'm going to challenge you by saying, don't get too down when thing, things bad happen to you. Fight through it. And the last couple things I want to leave you with, two final quotes. I really like this one. Maya Angelou just passed away not long ago. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. All right? Now, you might forget everything I said today. Hopefully, you remembered maybe a couple things. All right? But hopefully, I made you feel as though, wow, I'm glad I'm in business school. I'm glad that I'm going to have a chance to work for a company someday. And here's a chance for me to have an impact on other people. And the last thing, how many of you have dogs at home? All right? Aren't dogs unbelievable? These are my two dogs. The white one is Callie. She's a Wheaton Terrier. And the other crazy one is Winston. He's a crazy Labradoodle, all right? But when I go home every day, it doesn't matter if I had a good day or a bad day. These guys, are, they're all over me, right? They're all over me. And they love me, not just because I give them treats and take them for a walk. Because dogs actually really do love you. Studies show that. So here's my final quote I want to leave you with. Be the person your dog already thinks you are. All right? Does that make sense? Think about that. All right. Now I'm done. So I'm here to answer any questions you might have, either on anything that I said or I didn't say, or anything that might be on your mind as a result of uh, being here today. Anybody? Sir? Uh, have you ever ran into a situation where you had to reevaluate uh, like a moral standpoint in business? A moral standpoint in business? Or like uh, where you were talking earlier about the, the first principle. 
honest integrity. Yeah, like integrity where you were implementing like that. Yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, those kind of things happen all the time. And people don't always believe what you're saying. And that's why I would tell you that over time, there's, a, there's an old saying that says, I cannot hear your words because they are drowned out by the thunder of your actions. So when I talk about being consistent, people get to know you over time. I think most of the employees know how passionate I am about codes of conduct and behavior, not just the numbers. And sometimes you have to prove that. We've had some employees that were very good salespeople but didn't conduct themselves right, and unfortunately we had to let them go. And I think that sends a message. And I will tell you that I, I have never and I never will sacrifice a moral issue to make a decision. I will always try to do the right thing, even when it's, when it's very, very tough. But sometimes you are presented with those in business, and normally it's a personnel issue, somebody doing something. Uh, we had to let someone go who we found was, uh, you know, uh, stealing money. That's a pretty easy one, but those kind of things happen. The more ambiguous ones are a little bit tougher. And that's a very good question, and I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a great question, and I will tell you that when, when you're a leader of uh, multiple operations, and some people are, the, the blessing of that is you have multiple operations, you have people that are locally that can address the business needs in that local operation. The curse is that uh, it's easier when you have a small circle. Everybody could do the same things all the time. When you get in different branches, you have to be very careful that people aren't doing things differently in this side of the state than this side of the state. So part of it is just making sure that all the things that I talked about, our vision, our mission, our strategies, our goals, our key performance indicators, all those things that are all part of everyday business are communicated consistently throughout the company, whether they're in Pittsburgh or they're in Lancaster. The regular communication is extremely important, and you have to standardize certain systems and procedures without squashing individuality and creativity. But things like proposals, things like contracts, things like marketing material and branding, you want those to all be consistent so that when we're relinquishing our message into the marketplace, it looks the same no matter where we are. So, but that's a very, very astute question. I thank you for that one. Excellent. I think we've got time for maybe one more question. One more question. Okay. I have a question. Yes, sir, Sylvester. Thank you. Um, can you just maybe speak a little bit about the role data analytics is going to play in the future and maybe give them a little advice on how yep. they might want to think about yep. that area as they yeah. kind of stroll through their next couple yep. of years? Uh, it's an excellent question. I think that data analytics has, it's not become a buzzword, but it's become more in vogue lately. And I can, I can relate to it more as it relates to our industry, so I'll speak to that with some, with some credibility. I already showed you the study that Tara did for us. We do a lot of benchmarking, which requires a lot of data analytics, and that's gathering a lot of statistics about you know, what umbrella limits people are buying, what directors and office limits people are buying, what are their deductibles that they're choosing. Because everyone wants to make good decisions, and if I'm running a company, I may not know how much should I buy $25 million in coverage or should I buy $50 million in coverage? But if I have the data analytics to say, here's what other people around the country that are in my industry and are about my same size are buying, and maybe that will be helpful for me in deciding what we need to buy or what we need to retain in terms of risk. In the insurance business, data analytics has been around for a long time. In life insurance, life expectancy tables, actuarial tables, all that statistics about the average lifespan of men, women. If you buy insurance when you're 60 years old, how long are you expect to die? How do we price for that? Weather is an unbelievable new data analytics area, particularly with all the storms that we've been having, not just the hurricanes. The most expensive events aren't the hurricanes, they're these hailstorms, they're all these thunderstorms, flooding, all those kinds of things. So being able to predict what's going to happen in certain geographical areas or what's going to happen three years from now is a very important data analytic piece for the insurance business. So those are just some really small examples. And our business is kind of fun because it really marries math right, with people. Because we gotta have our math down, we gotta know the numbers, the premiums, 
what your return on investment is going to be if you hire us at this fee, and what's going to happen down the road. And you've got to have the people skills, too. And that's one other thing I want to mention to you. If you're very good at data analytics, or if you're an engineering type, right, and you're very good at that, but you can also put pictures that are in your head and other people's head by being good with people and being good in communication skills, the sky's the limit. All right. It doesn't mean you have to be. Some people are really good with people, and they, and they really suck at the math. Some people are really good at math, but you know, they're very nervous in social situations. I'm telling you, if you can be diverse like that, the sky's the limit. Thank you, Sylvester. Very good question. Well, the last thing is, thank you. I really appreciate being here today. Thank all of you. You inspire me, okay? Thanks.